So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Christine Muir. I am the community librarian at Cary Library. All of the programming at the library is made possible by the Cary Library Foundation. So thank you to everyone who has made a donation to them. I am recording tonight's program and I will send a link to all of you once I've posted it on the library's YouTube channel. You may share that with whomever you like. You may notice some subtitles at the bottom of your screen. Zoom recently enabled closed captioning, so that is available to you. If you find it distracting or if it blocks part of the presentation, you can click the up arrow next to that CC closed caption button and choose hide subtitles. I will be in the background throughout the program. So if you have any questions about the subtitles or any other technology, you can use the chat to ask me that. This program does run a full 90 minutes. So we will allow for a very short Q&A at the end. Um, you can enter any questions into the Q&A section by using that button on your toolbar. And we'll see how many we're able to answer at the end of the night. Our presenter tonight, Christopher Daly, has been lecturing all over New England for over 25 years on historical topics of interest. He is currently a history teacher in the Silver Lake Regional School System in Kingston, Massachusetts. And he holds a BA and an MA from Bridgewater State University in political science and history. Chris, welcome and thank you so much for being here. I will turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh... In, uh, in keeping it brief, this is a 90 uh, minute le lecture. We, we will just get right into it. How's that? Let's start. Contrary to popular belief, the Irish were not the first in Boston. It was, yes, the Puritans. And there was a massive wave of Puritans that came in 1630. And I guess you could say it was basically, it all started because of this man. We all know him. This is Henry VIII. And uh, unknown to many people, uh, he was actually a staunch Catholic up until the point that he wanted to get an annulment from the Pope and it was disallowed. And then he took the entire Church of England away from the, the Roman Catholic Church and created the Anglican Church. Well, if you were to go into an Anglican church today, you might think, hmm, I'm in a Catholic church. Well, they're very similar. The only difference really was you could get a divorce in the Anglican church, and, and Henry VIII was the leader of the church now, not the Pope. However, there were people during this time, it was known as the Reformation, there were other people that were breaking away from the Catholic church for more theological reasons. Martin Luther, he's the one that started the ball rolling with his 99 theses. And this man also, this is John Calvin. He was uh, a theologian that believed that Christians should go back to the foundations of Christianity, that first century Christian, before all the pomp and circumstance, the robes and the incense and the the crosses and the chalices and just get down to basics. And this is who the Puritans followed. And they were called Puritans because they wanted to purify this Anglican church. They wanted to come to America and create the church that they wanted because they, had a, they uh, were against the Royalists who were Anglicans. Now to give you a little uh, difference here, contrast, this is a Puritan church over in Hingham. This is the ship's church. Notice there are no crosses. There's no finery, uh, no chalices. This was bare bones. This was, I guess, maybe where the term fundamentalist came from. And these are the people that came to America because they wanted to practice their religion the way they saw fit. They wanted to decatholicize it. And they came to America to do that. And came, they did, a mass flotilla of 30 ships. Eventually, they ended up here. Their city on the hill, this is where they were going to have the what they called the New Jerusalem, where they would show the rest of the world how Christians should be. This is where they came. 
Now, when they came, this was called by the natives, this was called Shaman. And it was a peninsula that stuck out into what is now Boston Harbor. At high tide, it was an island. And this is where they came. This is where they were going to act on their religious beliefs the way they saw fit. And here's their city on the hill. If you were standing in Boston today, imagine standing on State Street and looking in the direction, although you couldn't see it, looking in the direction of the State House. This would be your view if you were standing there nearly 400 years ago. That is Beacon Hill. That is the center of Boston was State Street. And this is where they were going to start it off. And this is also where the first Irish came in Boston. Now, they did not come willingly. And here's the story why. They came as so-called indentured servants. Now, I don't know if you studied this in high school. My understanding of an indentured servant when I first learned it was that uh, you had a willing participant, somebody over in England, let's say, who wanted to come to New England, but could not afford the passage. They got in contact with somebody over here in America and arranged for them to pay the passage in return. They would sign an indenture contract, just like you see here, in which they agreed to work for that person for a period of four to seven years. And uh, after that time, they were free to go. Now, usually they were uh, taught a trade and uh, at the end of the indenture, they'd get uh, two suits of clothes and some money and they'd be sent on their way. That was what I learned. And normally that's the way it was carried out. But in the instance of the first Irish, it did not happen that way. This is how it happened because of this man. Now we talked about the Puritans against the Royalists. There was a clash and it ended up in a civil war. The Puritans won the civil war. And actually the King, King Charles was beheaded at the end of the civil war. So England did not have a King, but they had this man. This was Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector of the Commonwealth. Before he was given this title, he was actually the general of what they called the New Model Army, which crushed the Royalist Army and took control over England. And he came in and they offered him the title king, but he said, no, I am the Lord Protector. Now, after he took control of England, uh, stories started coming over from Ireland about rebels in Ireland. Now, uh, Ireland had been uh, under uh, the control of England for years and years and years, going almost all the way back to William the Conqueror's when they first started to impinge on Ireland. And he was starting to hear rumors from, from these rebels over in Ireland who were killing their English landlords and uh, committing horrible atrocities. And some of these things were pretty bad. If you read them, uh, in hindsight, historians have discovered that a lot of these stories were greatly exaggerated. But this is what Oliver Cromwell heard. He, he heard of these atrocities being committed against English landlords. And he decided to take his new model army fresh off the battlefield from fighting royalists and point it towards Ireland. And that he did. And in the first place he landed, was the medieval wall city of Drogheda. Now, his army quickly surrounded the city and they demanded that the mayor surrender. And of course, the mayor did not surrender. And then what Mr. Cromwell did was he, he waved the red flag, which that means, if you know anything about military parlance, that means there will be no quarter. If we breach that wall, you can expect no quarter, no prisoners. And that's what happened. They, they had a long drawn out battle and finally they got through the wall of Drogheda and they went on a murder spree. Now the number that you're looking at right now is not the number of soldiers killed. This is the number of civilians murdered after this, this so-called uh, battle, this massacre. Now, after that, he set his sights on another city because Ireland had not succumbed. They had not totally surrendered yet. 
and the next city was Wexford. And you can see the numbers go down greatly because they heard what happened in Drogheda. And then finally, he tied it all up with the siege of Waterford here. Ireland was on her knees. They were subjugated once again to the overlord, Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Oliver Cromwell. Now he wasn't through yet. After this, in the 1650s, Cromwell's, under Cromwell's reign of terror, over 100,000 Irish children were ripped from their Catholic parents' arms, sold as slaves in the West Indies, Virginia, and New England. Slaves, or I guess you could say indentured servants. Thousands of men and women were also abducted and sold as indentured servants in the Americas as well. And this is how it started. This is how the first Irish came to Boston. And this is an image of how they came. And you can imagine them lined up in front of their Puritan masters. And you know what the first thing they did once they touched land, the first thing they did was they ran away. They tried to get away. And this is very fascinating. I found this. This is a runaway slave ad. And uh, there are two actually here. And if you look at the top one, they're looking for a Negro fellow. And on the bottom, an Irishman. And oftentimes the Irish and the African Americans would help each other. They'd run away together and try to get away. Now, it was much easier for that Irishman to get away and blend in the crowd. In, in the uh, African-American, it was a lot harder for him for obvious reasons. All the Irishman had to do was keep his mouth shut. And then they, that Gaelic brogue wouldn't come out. But a lot of times they were captured and they were returned. And this is what they could expect. They could expect probably on the first instance to be put in the pillory or the stocks. Now, if you look at that, it doesn't look so bad. You know, it looks like you're in a nice afternoon, just sitting out. You can rest your head or rest your arms. Now, now, this, this was pure and utter humiliation. You could expect a scene more like this, where you would be pummeled for the entire day. Everybody from the city would come with any kind of garbage, any kind of offal they found in the street and be throwing it in your face heckling you and jeering you. This is what the Irish faced if they tried to escape. Now, if you, if you deign to do it again, you might get this punishment. This is called being whipped at the cart's tail. And in this punishment, you would be tied to the back of a cart and wheeled through the city as people would just come out and whip you at random. In Boston, many of these punishments were carried out in this part of the city. This is State Street. This is where the old townhouse was. And if you think about it, if you look at this, uh, I think you're very familiar with this area or if you're familiar with Boston. This is almost the same vantage point. That is where the old townhouse was. This is also the site of the, the famous Boston Massacre. That is the state house that replaced the old townhouse. Now, we haven't heard much about the Scots-Irish. We've talked a little bit about the, uh, the Catholic-Irish up to this point. Let me explain, who are, who are the Scots-Irish? Why are they called Scots-Irish? Well, during this time when the Puritans had control over England, they had fellow Calvinists up in Scotland. Now, they didn't call themselves Puritans up in Scotland. They called themselves Presbyterians. And they were fellow Calvinists, as I said. They believed in the same theories of religion. And they agreed with the English that we need to colonize Ireland. And that's what actually happened. Many of the Scots-Irish Presbyterians colonized the northern part of Ireland. This is why even today, we have a, a, a large population of Protestants in the north of Ireland. And everything was going well with them up until the Restoration. <laughs> it seems that <laughs> England uh, didn't like living under Puritan rule too longer. And after about 10 years, they threw it off. 
and they uh, brought the king back. Now, that king that you just saw there was not Charles I. So obviously, he lost his head. This is Charles II, his son. And when Charles II was put on the throne, the royalists, the Anglicans were back in control, and the Puritans were on the outs. Furthermore, there was a law passed, and this was called the Sacramental Test of 1704, and this basically said that anywhere in the, in the British Isles, including Scotland, there could only be Anglican ministers, and basically the, the uh, Presbyterians were outlawed too. So many Presbyterians from Northern Ireland, these Scots-Irish, had been almost a, a generation now that they'd been there, decided to leave and come to America because the Puritans still held sway in America and they could join them in their religious fervor, their Calvinist fervor. And in fact, they were invited by this gentleman. Maybe you've heard of him. His name is Cotton Mather. And I've looked at several of his letters and joining them to come over and join the Puritans. And they did that. They came over, but they found that uh, once they got here, it wasn't such a friendly deal after all, because many of these people that thought they were going to live in Boston were uh, asked to go and live on the frontier, so to say, out in the western parts of New Hampshire, Maine, uh, uh, western Massachusetts. And if you look at it, almost they were almost set up like kind of a, a buffer between Boston and the Native American tribes that were constantly fighting back and forth with the English. Now, if you look at this, they were religious brethren. They were both Calvinists, but they were still Scottish. And as you know, the Scottish and the English haven't had a very good history as well as the Irish and the, his and the English haven't had a good history. And to give you an uh, example of how these Puritans thought about their fellow uh, Calvinists, they, a small group of them did start a church in Boston in this church was called by the Puritans, the Church of the Presbyterian Strangers. And that gives you an idea how they felt about these newcomers. Although they were uh, Calvinist, Protestant, they were still Scottish. Now, if you were to go uh, to this location today, which uh, I believe is uh, 100 Federal Street, this is what you'll find. Yes, this uh, I couldn't take a picture of the whole thing, so I got the bottom of it. This is 100 Federal Street. There's the rest of it. Now that church is long gone. That building is long gone, but the congregation survives today. And this is the congregation. This is the church today. This is the first congregational church over by uh, Boston Garden. And they are the uh, inheritors of the Church of the Presbyterian Strangers. So the struggle begins. There's a small group of Irish within Boston. Uh, many of them came over unwillingly. Some of them still spoke Gaelic. Uh, very, very foreign to these English. And this is one thing that started. There was an anti-Catholic law passed in 1647. Now, what, what inspired this law or what kicked it off was that there were rumors going around Boston that there was a Jesuit priest about secretly saying mass in probably basements out in the woods. And they, they were horrified that there'd be anything Catholic in their new Jerusalem. So they pass this law. Here's the actual text of the law. I will read it to you. Death to all and every Jesuit seminary priest, missionary, or spiritual ecclesiastical person made or ordained by any authority, power, or jurisdiction derived, challenged, or pretended from the Pope or See of Rome. Translation, no Catholics. No Irish Catholics. And then there was another incident that occurred in 1688. This is the story of Goodwife Glover, who was one of these indentured servants. She was first brought to the West Indies with her husband, who it said was murdered there because of his religion. And 
somehow she found her way to New England. And she and her daughters came to work for the Puritan John Goodwin. They lived over in what is now the North End. And uh, a little uh, row broke out between the daughters, uh, Goodwife Glover and the daughters of John Goodwin. Uh, Goodwife Glover or Goody Glover as she was called, her daughters were accused of stealing laundry and they were accused by the daughters of John Goodwin. Well, they went home and they told their mother and she went full steam ahead back to the home of John Goodwin and gave those daughters the wherewithal. And after this, this big fight, all of a sudden, John Goodwin's daughters started to have fits and they'd fall on the floor or on the ground and say that Goodwife Glover was a witch and she was cursing them. Does this sound familiar? Yes. This is the template for Salem. And this is what resulted. Now, Goodwife Glover, Goody Glover was brought in before the magistrates and she was accused of being a witch. Now, back then they had this, this was the manual on how to identify witches. And probably the first thing they would do when brought before the magistrates would be to ask one who is accused of being a witch to recite the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. And it, it said in this manual, if you could not do it, therefore you were in league with the devil because the, the devil would not say the Lord's Prayer. Well, they asked Good Wife Glover to do it, and she did. The only thing was she recited the Lord's Prayer in Latin, the only way she knew how. Therefore, on a technicality, she could not recite the Lord's Prayer to their satisfaction. And she was also very haughty on the stage. She, she was uh, giving them uh, back talk as well, these, these high and mighty magistrates. So as a result, because she would not uh, admit that she was a witch and she could not recite the Lord's Prayer, she was taken down to Boston Neck and hang as a witch. Now she's referred to as the first Irish martyr in Boston. I've read accounts of this, read accounts from the Puritans and they knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, she was no witch, she was a mouthy Irish woman and this is what she got for it. And if uh, you, you go into the North End, I don't think this, uh, this restaurant is there anymore. And it, it was kind of an anomaly uh, a few years back, an Irish restaurant in the North End. Uh, I don't think they lasted too long. They couldn't compete with the, uh, the, the, the uh, venues down on um, Hanover Street. But I went there and I found this, this plaque that they had out there, uh, as I said, referred to her as the first Irish martyr. And they did at one time, I doubt it's still there anymore, but they had a little uh, rendering of what they thought Goody Glover might have looked like. A grandmotherly looking woman. Now, speaking of uh, England, let's go back to England. Now in England, they have a holiday, much like our 4th of July, it occurs on the 5th of November. And it's celebrating something called the gunpowder plot. Now you think, wow, wow, what's this? Now, here's the story behind the story. There, there were a group of unsatisfied Catholics in England uh, who were probably facing some of the same uh, um, bigotry as they were in Boston. They planned to blow Parliament sky high. The way they plan to do this was they had uh, secreted barrels of gunpowder into the basement of parliament. And they were waiting for when there was a full session and they were gonna light that gunpowder up and blow parliament sky high. And you're probably thinking to yourself, why would the English be celebrating this? It was foiled, the plan was found out it's because this man who was supposed to be guarding the gunpowder was found out and his name is Guy Fawkes. That's what they also call it now. They call it Guy Fawkes Day. It's still celebrated in England today. Now Guy Fawkes was found, he was arrested 
and they they uh, were able to stop that gunpowder from going off. He was taken here to the Tower of London, and you know what they do to people in the Tower of London. It wasn't before long he gave up all of his Confederates, this, this uh, group of Catholics that had planned to blow Parliament sky high. And here is a, a rendering of what they might have looked like back then. Now, they were all put on trial. And in Great Britain, they were put on trial for treason, betraying one's country. Now, this is probably or was probably the worst thing you could ever be convicted of in Great Britain. Because once they were convicted and they were sentenced, the sentence was horrific. It was, be, it was called to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. Now, what would happen? would be that the prisoners would be drawn to the gallows, dragged to the gallows, put on the gallows, the noose would be placed around the neck. And then they'd pull the victim up, strangling him with an inch of his life and then letting him fall, gasping for air. And it's at this point that he would be tied to a table and cut stem to stern and his innards would be removed. Sometimes these men were still conscious. And then if that wasn't bad enough, after that, they would be quartered. And this is what a typical quartering would look like. Each of your limbs would be ripped off of your body and then your head would be severed and put on a pike on London Bridge to warn anybody of committing treason against the great British Empire. Now, you're probably thinking, why is he talking about this? What does this have to do with Boston? Well, this holiday, this Guy Fox Day, translated over to Boston, but it wasn't called Guy Fox Day over here. It was called Pope's Day. And in Boston, this is how it was celebrated. Each neighborhood would make an effigy of the Pope, and they'd cart it around the city to each of the other neighborhoods, and the other neighborhoods would try to tear it apart as best they could. And at the end of the day, the neighborhood that still had the effigy of Pope somewhat intact won the day. And there was plenty of drinking and carousing, as you can see from this depiction. Now, this Pope's Day was an absolute affront to anyone that was Irish. And this was recognized. And it was recognized by this man. You might know him if you look on your dollar bill, if you look on Mount Rushmore. Yes, that is George Washington. Shortly after the British were evacuated from Boston, uh, mainly due to an Irishman, Henry Knox, bringing cannon down from Fort Ticonderoga, Washington witnessed this. He was appalled and he put an end to it. He said, I have men who are from Ireland in my army fighting for freedom. We're fighting against this. This will stop. And as time goes on, things begin to calm down a little bit. They're not looking for Jesuit priests anymore. And the, the Irish Catholics come out of the shadows. The first mass, the first Catholic mass celebrated in Boston was on November 2nd, 1788, right here on the corner of Washington and School Street, right where that Irish famine memorial is. There was an old Huguenot church that they used. And I should note, this was actually the first Catholic mass in New England. And these people have been here since 1630. And this is the first time they were uh, allowed to openly worship their own faith. Here are some other firsts. The first cathedral in Boston was built in 1803, and this was the Cathedral of the Holy Cross. And this is the marker uh, where it is. This was uh, where it was, I should say. This was over at 47 Franklin Street. And uh, at one time, uh, when I actually took this photograph, it was still uh, the property of the Boston Archdiocese. I believe it uh, had been used as a dormitory for St. John's Cemetery. I'm sorry, seminary. 
And uh, the last I heard, uh, it had been sold and it is now a, uh, I guess it's a Mexican restaurant. The first burial ground in Boston was St. Augustine's over in uh, South Boston. And the date on that was 1818. Here it is. These are some of the first Irish Catholic official graves here. And that begs the question, what did these people do until 1818? If, if, you're, if you grew up Catholic, you know that you have to be buried in a consecrated burial ground. There was none until 1818. We know that there were Irish burials. These are, uh, uh, this is a picture of two Irish burials. They were usually put in paupers' graves. They knew that they were Irish because of the, uh, the artifacts found on them. Now, my feeling is probably uh, this could be borne out by some research that uh, the consecration took place when the priest put some holy water in the ground. And that was probably enough until they had actual consecrated burial ground. And the city of Boston fought this tooth and nail until uh, 1818 just to be able to bury your own dead. In the first Irish Catholic newspaper was the Pilot, which still exists today. It's more of a uh, Catholic newspaper now, but it was started off as an Irish Catholic uh, newspaper in 1829. Well, most people, if you go out in the street today and you say, uh, "How did the Irish come here?" they'll say, "Oh, it has something to do with a potato thingy." Well, when did that happen? The 1920s or something? I don't know. Actually, it didn't. It uh, started in the 1820s as a trickle, as I say. The, the, the famine wouldn't be for another 20 years in the 1840s. And this is why it started. If you look, there were many British laws passed against Irish Catholics in their own country. Now, now uh, Great Britain is running the... Uh, Irish, uh, the, the, uh, Ireland, Ireland, uh, the island of Ireland. And if you look here, look at these, these laws that were passed. I'll read just a, a couple of them. I'm not going to go through the whole list. Um, you were forbidden to exercise your religion. You couldn't hold public office. You couldn't purchase land. You couldn't vote. Down here, you couldn't educate your child in your own religion. Uh, what is happening here, folks, is slowly, th this is over time, they didn't just pass these all at once, uh, slowly but surely they're stripping away the human rights of the Irish people. And many people in Ireland saw this, they saw that they were losing their rights. And many people had already been uh, taken off of their lands, and uh, English landlords had taken that land. However, there were still some that owned land, and these Enclosure acts were passed. Again, this wasn't just one law. It was a series of laws passed over time. But to summarize here, basically, if you still had land, you could not plant on it. You could not harvest any lumber. You couldn't uh, raise animals on it. You, If you had a little pond, you couldn't even fish on it. There was one thing you could do. You could sell it to an Englishman. And many people saw the writing on the wall, they took the money and they left and they came here to America. And you can see in Boston, this is born out in Boston. Look at these uh, numbers. The population of Irish in uh, 1820 was about 2,000. In five years, it jumped 3,000 to 5,000 by 1825. And then the population had spiked to 7,000 by 1830. Now, if you look, put this in context of the total population, the total population of Boston was around 61,000. So this is beginning to be a big population of Irish in the city. And now we're talking the mid 1830s. We're not talking about Puritans anymore. We're talking about the, the descendants of the Puritans who are now being referred to as the Boston Brahmins, that high class that lives up on Beacon Hill. And you had these people who controlled everything with this group of Irish now. And trouble starts immediately. We start seeing problems. Here are some of the early conflicts. There were many, but I'm only going to talk about a couple here. 
Um, although this did not happen in Boston proper, it's close enough to talk about. Uh, this actually happened in Charlestown. The area that it happened in uh, Charlestown was later given over to Somerville. So if you want to visit the site today, it's actually in Somerville. Um, there was an uh, uh, Ursuline convent on Mount Benedict over in Charlestown. Now, this was a convent, but it was also a school for girls. And you would think that it'd be a school for Catholic girls, but no. Actually, the Boston Brahmins sent their daughters here because they knew it was a first class education. They educated the girls in the classics, music, you name it, they, they learned it there. And what happened was there were a series of incidents that ended up in tragedy. First thing that we have here is Rebecca Reed. Rebecca Reed was actually of um, a Protestant stock, you might say. She wasn't one of the Brahmins up on Beacon Hill. Came from uh, smaller means, you might say. Um, and she came on a scholarship to the convent to get an education. Now, from all, all that's been told about her was that she did well. She did so well, it was said that she was considering becoming a novice and converting to Catholicism to later become a nun. And then mysteriously, she just disappeared. And then this appeared, this, this manuscript that she wrote called Six Months in a Convent, in which she told of these horrible tortures that the nuns were committing and how they were trying to brainwash the girls and how they were uh, chaining them to the walls in the basement and all of these horrible things. None of it true. People read this, but they, they believed it. They didn't know what to think. And then another incident happened where uh, the music teacher, this is Sister Mary St. John, uh, was teaching her class. And, and it said, I think it was in August. I guess they had the school all during the summer. God bless them. <laughs> I'm a teacher. I, I wouldn't want to teach in that kind of weather. But she lost her temper somehow. She threw down her baton or class did something or we don't really know what. And she stormed out of the convent. She ended up in the parlor of one of the leading Brahmin families complaining about the day. Pretty soon, uh, the, the governess or the um, mother superior, uh, Sister Mary St. George arrived. And she sat down with Sister Mary John. And uh, by this time she had cooled down and she was embarrassed and she was worried that she was gonna be punished. And nothing, nothing like that happened. She was welcomed back into the convent. Uh, Sister Mary St. George probably understood the, the, uh, the trials and tribulations of uh, a teacher during this time. So she was welcomed back. What was the story? The story was that she was dragged back, kicking and screaming, and that she was being held there against her will. Well, pretty soon, the, the selectmen of Charleston got wind of this, and a lot of people were complaining about it, and they approached the convent, and they banged on the door, and they demanded entry to inspect this convent and find out what's going on here. And Sister Sarah, uh, Mary St. George, the mother superior, actually stuck her head out of this window right here and told them where to go. And they were not too happy. They went to the bishop, Bishop Fenwick, and they complained. And quickly, the bishop made his way over there and said, look, just let him into the convent. He was more of a politician. Let him look around. We're not hiding anything. So they came into the convent. They looked around. And what did they find? They found students engaged. They loved their, their teachers. There were no chains. Nobody was being brainwashed. They interviewed the, the girls that were there. And uh, everything that they had heard was false. However, they didn't publish this. They didn't go out and tell anybody. So the talking in town was still going, still going. Huh. And then this guy came to town. This is Reverend Lyman Beecher, a real fire and brimstone preacher. Yes, the father of Harriet Beecher Stowe. And he came to Boston. He was pushing his anti-Catholic book, A Plea for the West, which is a totally anti-Catholic book. 
and he gave three sermons. In one of the sermons, he actually advocated burning down the cathedral. Well, this seemed to be the tinder for the flame that would come. Pretty soon, a group of people formed outside of the convent. Some of them were made up of workmen that actually worked in around the convent. And people started chanting for the release of the nun, the release of the students being held. And the crowd got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm sure there was some drinking going on here. And pretty soon they were banging on that door and Sister Mary St. George did the same thing and she told them where to go. And the next thing she knew, they, that door was kicked in and there was a mob coming into the convent. Now, the nuns took their charges, their students, and they went out the back door as this mob came in and they began to destroy the convent. There's stories of clothes going out the windows, a piano at one point was thrown out the window. They began to pilfer and steal anything they could. And then somebody lit a match. And it went up in flames. They burnt that convent to the ground. And here are some depictions of that from the period. It said that the fire department came and it was too late. They just stood there and they watched it burn. Now the next morning, the uh, fathers of Boston, the Puritans, looked out from their perches in Beacon Hill and they saw the smoldering ember of a convent. The, even they were appalled. The, uh, the mayor and the governor got together and they decided since they heard the, in the wind that the next, the next target was going to be the cathedral, they decided that night to put the militia in front of the cathedral and yes, the mob started again and they went heading for the cathedral. They saw the militia and they turned right around and they went back to the convent to pick over what was left. It said at this point, they broke into the tombs of nuns that had been buried there and stole the gold fillings from their teeth. Well, this was a big black mark on the history of Boston. But if you go there today, there's just a monument. And the monument is actually about half a mile down the street from the actual site. And if you walk up onto Mount St. Benedict, which has been leveled to some degree, they uh, use some of the soil to fill in the Boston, uh, the marshes. I've walked through here and I've looked at the windows and I've said to myself, do you think anybody that lives here actually knows anything about what happened here back in the 1830s? There's not much to remind you. Maybe a sign that says Benedict Street reminding you of Mount St. Benedict that used to be there. And then there was the Broad Street Riot. This happened, uh, I believe, in 1835. And the story is that a group of Irish were coming back from a wake and they crossed paths with a group of Yankee uh, firemen that it would just come to a fire. Somebody said something to somebody and a riot broke out, a big fight in the middle of the street. And this just spread throughout the neighborhood into this massive melee. And if you can imagine what it was like on these same streets, these streets were once uh, an Irish ghetto. Broad Street was the first Irish neighborhood. Today, it's the financial district of Boston that there were people in the streets picking up any weapon that they could get and trying to pummel their neighbor. This is what it might have looked like. People were going in and out of the houses, looting, setting houses on fire. By the end of it, uh, there were a number of Catholics arrested and a number of uh, the Yankee firemen arrested and they were brought into court and the only ones to be punished were the Catholics, the Irish Catholics. So even before the great hunger, the, the great uh, potato famine, as they call it, uh, there were problems in Boston and it would just get worse. So I don't think a lot of people understand what happened with this uh, potato blight is probably a more appropriate word. Um, even when I was growing up, I thought, why didn't they just eat something else? How come they all ate just potatoes? And this is why. 
Uh, there were great farms in Ireland. They grew everything, wheat, barley, corn. Now these farms were owned by the English landlords and uh, tenant farmers worked them, the Irish tenant farmers, who generations before their ancestors owned the same land. And they were relegated to these little plots of land that they, they uh, were able to plant their own food on. Here you can still see these enclosures here. And they had to plant something that, that could keep them alive for a year. And they had these small little plots of land that they could plant this on. And the potato was perfect for that. You could plant it and just in a small patch like this, you could plant enough potatoes to live on for a year. And then the potato famine hits, that food source is gone. Now these people are working on these giant, uh, you know, estates, you could call them and farming the real food. Meanwhile, they're starting to starve to death. And this is uh, what happened. The government initially under Sir Robert Peel was a little bit more sympathetic than it would be later. And they set up uh, soup kitchens, they set up workhouses, things to try to help feed these people who had run out of their food source. Meanwhile, they're still growing all these other crops and shipping them out for profit not giving them to the, their own people. And then there was a change in administration and the new prime minister was elected, Lord John Russell from the, uh, I guess you could, they called them the conservative party back then, or um, today we uh, call them uh, the liberal party, but today uh, you call them conservative because they believed in uh, laissez-faire government. Uh, as little government intervention as possible. And they removed the soup kitchens, they removed all the workhouses, and they just believed if you let things run its course, it'll kind of shake out in the end. And in, in fact, they believed uh, the common belief among these folks was it was the Irish, it was their own fault that this happened anyways. And then it just got worse and people started to die by the thousands. And then uh, the poor laws were passed. And essentially parliament took a hands up <laughs> approach and they put it all on the landlords who didn't live in Ireland. And they said, basically, it's your problem, you take care of it. And what happened eventually, these people became so weakened by starvation that they couldn't work and therefore they couldn't pay their rent and they were evicted in great numbers. Here you see, this is a, a a uh, um, depiction of uh, a family being evicted from their cottage. And then they were just sent out into the wilderness to survive and, and eat whatever they could find, whatever they could scrounge. And these are actual drawings made by reporters uh, from life. If they had uh, photojournalism, you could imagine what, this is kind of like Ethiopia in the 80s. People are starving to death. And this is in the papers all over the world, this great starvation that's going on. And this, this really brings it home here. You've got a family here. If you look closely, what's going on here? The son, he's trying to eat what's left of his shoe there. Dad's pulling bark off the tree. Maybe that has some kind of nutritional value. Is that woman alive or is she dead? Her baby is suckling on her and she looks like she's dead. This brings it home. This gives you the stark reality of the starvation that was going on. And people just began to die in the thousands. And I have to give a um, kind of credit to the Yankees uh, up on Beacon Hill. At this time, they actually filled up a ship full of food called the Jamestown and they sent it over to Ireland to help the people. And these are all taken from life. If you can imagine them as photographs. Here they are taking dead bodies away. Now, I did come across a story that was kind of frightening. Uh, there was an American who was visiting in Ireland at this time and he had an Irish host and he was being taken around and he noticed that there were just dead bodies on the side of the road. And uh, if that wasn't bad enough, he noticed that they all had green around their mouths. And he asked his host, he said, 
why, why do they all green around their mouths? And the host turned to him and matter of fact, he said, it's because they've been eating the grass. You can't eat the grass. You can't survive on grass. And the thing about this is it did not have to happen. There were plenty of crops. They were just not directed to the right place. And then people just decided they had to, somehow they had to get out. Some of the landlords financed passage over. Some people were able to get on board ships and they got out. And the total population of Ireland dropped by 25%, either through immigration or death. And this is how they came to America on these packed ships. These ships were called coffin ships, appropriately enough. And if you can imagine taking a voyage that could take up to two months on this packed ship with the people that already were sick, what the results would be. And I, I look at images like this, and I remember my days thinking about the Middle Passage where the Africans would be packed in the tight pack, loose pack. I'm, I'm not saying that this is that, but it reminds you of the conditions and the same conditions are going on here. There are contagious diseases. Uh, people are vomiting on here. They're defecating. You can imagine the stench of this, this hold. And just like in the Middle Passage, every morning, there'd be bodies to throw overboard. And can you imagine the joy of these people when they sighted land and they knew they were in America, but what they found wasn't what they thought it would be. This was not the land of uh, milk and honey. The streets were not paved in gold. And in many cases, they landed in the biggest slums in, in the United States. Some of them were welcomed by uh, relatives that were already there. And some of them uh, came into conditions like this. This is actually a depiction of the five points down in uh, lower Manhattan in New York City, which was probably where many of the Irish ended up, Boston, Philadelphia, New York City. Uh, and this was one of the worst ghettos of all time. Uh, Charles Dickens once took a tour here and he said it was worse than Calcutta. It was so bad. And this is how they arrived on our shores. Sick, diseased. And this is the statuary that's down in Boston, the Irish Famine Memorial. And uh, I know it's supposed, to, it's supposed to depict the same family a few years later. I have my own take on it. I like to say that maybe you should look at it as the modern Irish family needs to look at where their roots are. This is where we came from. And this is what they came to in Boston. The Irish settled uh, in uh, areas of uh, Boston were the, uh, the Boston Waterfront, the Battery March, Broad Street, the North End, and East Boston. Uh, Southie or South Boston wouldn't be settled by the Irish for years to come. Uh, these were the original places. And they came here. This is an aerial shot of Boston taken from a balloon in the 1850s. It was mainly wooden tenement buildings. And uh, they came in and they were shoved into sheds, barns, stable, low ceiling garrets, basements, cellars, under the most unsanitary conditions imaginable. Boston was already full. When these Irish immigrants came, it was like a tsunami of humanity. If you can imagine, uh, one year there were 75 thousand Irish that came to Boston alone. This brings it to light a little bit. One survey indicated that there were 67 toilets 
in 118 houses inhabited by 540 immigrants. 17 of those did not work. They were out of order. One state might serve a whole stinking tenement building, one outhouse, an entire neighborhood. Disease continued. People continued to die when they got here. And these were the conditions that they lived in. Now, what were the, the working conditions? Oh, by the way, this is, uh, here are some shots of the North End, which uh, I was surprised to find was originally an Irish ghetto. And uh, since my research, when I, when I go there for, for an Italian dinner, I'll see places like this. And in my mind, I'll see this. This is what it was like in the North End for the Irish. It was these crowded tenement buildings. Now they, they're like gentrified in these apartments that were once places where uh, several families lived or inhabited by maybe one or two people at a high rate. And here are some of the same streets that they lived on. Now, of course, these were taken much later after the famine, uh, but it was still an Irish neighborhood by then. Now, here were the, some of the working conditions. Now, if you were a woman, you had uh, basically two options. You could be a washerwoman who spent her life on her knees scrubbing floors, or you could be a chambermaid, somebody who worked for the Brahmins up on Beacon Hill. Both either way work for the Brahmins probably, but this is the options you had open to you back then. If you were a man, there were many more options. You could be a waiter. Uh, however, you could be a barber. Believe it or not, the African Americans had the corner on the barber market. All barbers in Boston were African American. Uh, now, you have to think about this. Most of these Irish that came to Boston were farmers. There are no farms in Boston. So they had to get what they could take. Here's another uh, job option for you uh, if you got here, uh, working in a grocery store. I guess this would be the equivalent to a 7-Eleven or a Cumberland Farms. And of course, if that factory didn't have the no Irish need apply sign, and yes, they did exist, uh, you'd be working 14 hours a day, six, uh, six days a week. In the wintertime, you'd be freezing. The summertime, you'd be sweltering. You were at that machine all day. There were no breaks. You ate at that machine. You took your smoke breaks at that machine because time was money. They worked on piecework and they had to produce as much as they could to survive. But it was better than starving. And here is what Boston looked like during these times. This is long before the EPA, obviously. And of course, there were the longshoremen, the men that worked on the docks loading those ships. They didn't have big cranes and containers back then. Everything was brought on and off the ships by men and they were Irish. And here's what the waterfront looked like back in those days. And here's a shot of what that same waterfront looks like today. And of course, you could be a ditch digger, a black legs, a muckraker, some of the hardest labor you can imagine. A lot of these men, these first generation Irish that came to Boston simply worked themselves to death. Many of them were dead before they were in their 50s because of the hard work. And to show you this hard work, this is much of what they did. They built Boston, and it started with the raising of Beacon Hill. They took down the soil in Beacon Hill and started to fill in the marshy areas around Boston. And this graphic shows it brilliantly. Here's what the Puritans found in 1630, that shama that became an island during high tide. And this is what the Irish did to it. By 1830, 
they filled in the Mill Pond area. And then next was the Great Cove area, the West Cove area. And you know, it's interesting if you ever go into Boston, you go into Chinatown and there's a street called Beach Street and you're like, well, where's the beach? I'm in the middle of the street. At one time, that street went to the beach. And of course the end, the Great Back Bay project, which by that time, sure, there were steam shovels and a lot of the soil came from Needham and Wellesley. This is what the Irish did. This is what the Irish uh, did to Boston. They made it the Boston we know today. And because of this great flood of Irish humanity into Boston, of course, there was going to be a backlash. And it took the form of a political party. This party started out as a secret society called the Know Nothing Party. It said that they would have these secret meetings and the members were told if anybody asked them what went on in the meetings, they were told to say, I know nothing, kind of like Sergeant Schultz and Hogan's Heroes. They later morphed into the Native American Party and they uh, had a platform kind of a, a dichotomous platform. On one end, they were anti-immigrant, they were anti-Catholic. But on the other end, they were abolitionists and they wanted to free the slaves. Uh, this party was very short-lived. They would disintegrate within 10 years and the faction that was the abolitionist part of the party would eventually become known as the Republican Party, the modern Republic, Republican Party, the party of Lincoln. Now, in Massachusetts, the results of this, this backlash were very evident. In the election of 1854, the American Party, or the Know Nothing, swept every state constitutional office, including the governor. They won all 40 state Senate races and carried every U.S. constitutional district. Out of 381 seats up for election, they won 379. It was a massive landslide. And here is their, their know-nothing governor, Henry J. Gardner. And I'd like to say he was just the first know-nothing. We've had many since. In his inaugural address, Gardner stated that the Irish Catholic influx was the greatest problem facing the Commonwealth. Now the Know Nothings went right to work. They abolished the reading of any Bible except for the King James Bible in public schools. They banned the teaching of all foreign languages. They disbanded any Irish militia units. They proposed a constitutional amendment to forbid Roman Catholics from holding office in Massachusetts. This amendment to the Constitution failed by one vote, I'm told. Under a pauper removal act, 1,300 Irish paupers were collected from asylums and shipped back to Ireland. They also formed the Joint Legislative Committee on the Inspection of Nunneries and Convents. And here you have a newspaper cartoon depicting that. Here you see these people inspecting a convent. Oh, what have they found? Oh, a rosary. And what could that be? In uh, the parlance of the day, that would be referred to as a thunder jug. Well, here are some depictions in the news of Irish. If you look at that, the poor house from Galway is coming to America. Here's one I like. You have to look at this one very closely. Those are not alligators. Those are actually bishops in mitre hats. And you can see the Vatican looming on the horizon, threatening these innocent native, so-called Native Americans. And here you have it. This, this is a nice Irishman. He's depicted very nicely compared to what you're going to see here. This is the typical way that they would depict Irish in the newspapers. And our friend Thomas Nast was responsible for a lot of those, if you're familiar with the Tweed era. Yeah, 
ape-like. Uh, near do wells, they don't work. They just sit around and drink all day and fight with their wives. This is the typical depiction of the Irish. And again, here you have sitting on a powder keg of rum there. And oh, God forbid they get involved in politics because you know who controls the Irish. I think they were saying that up until about 1960. And here we have another group in America at the time that was not too well liked. Seems that they were liked a little bit better than the Irish. Here's another one. So who would you like as your nurse? Florence Nightingale or Bridget McBrosa? And here we have Lady Liberty grabbing this near do well Irishman by the neck before he destroys civilization. Well, after a while, the Irish had had enough of this and they started to organize. Now, starting with Patrick McGuire, uh, he came uh, from Ireland in, uh, he came to Prince Edward Island from Ireland in 1838 at the age of 14, moved to Boston became a printer's apprentice. He got involved in real estate and became very wealthy. He established the Republic, an Irish Catholic newspaper. And his goal was to strive to get Irish elected to city positions like the Common Council or the Board of Aldermen. And he started to work with the liberal Brahmins. This is why I call this the age of cooperation. Some of the old Yankee stock started to work with these Irishmen. And then there was Patrick Collins. He came uh, from County Cork in 1844. His father died at a young age, like many of the politicians I'm about to tell you about. 1868, he became a state legislator. And then he formed the Young Men's Democratic Club, which was really the first uh, ward club. They helped people when they came from Boston newly arrived immigrants, if they needed a house or if they needed a job, if they just needed food, they were there to help them. And this kicked off the era of uh, ward bosses, you might say. And then there was Hugh O'Brien. He came to America in 1832, became a successful businessman. And in 1875, he uh, was elected to the Board of Aldermen. And then eventually in 1885, he became the first Catholic Irish Catholic mayor of Boston. He proved to be a very effective mayor. He worked well with the liberal Brahmins. And uh, he was the, the actual mayor that laid the cornerstone for the Boston Public Library. And he served three one-year terms as mayor. And then Pat, Patrick Collins becomes the second mayor of, of Boston. Well, as I said, this started out the age of the ward boss and probably the most quintessential Boston ward boss of them all was Martin Lemansky. He came in 1859 and he grew up selling newspapers, shining shoes, running errands, and he worked his way up to ward boss. And as I say, he was the quintessential ward boss. If anybody needed anything, they came to Lamansky. He was called the Boston Mahatma. And he founded the Hendricks Club over in the West End of Boston near North Station. And this is where people came if they needed help, you know? And they got it, but it was not free. He asked one thing of you. If you got help from the Hendricks Club, if you got help from Lamansky, Lamansky, he required you to vote the way they wanted you to. They had controlled entire blocks of voters. And he became very, very powerful. Now, there were some men that I guess you could say studied at his knee. They were somewhat protégés, you could say. Let me introduce you to them. Here's a young man by the name of Johnny Fitz, Fitzgerald, he's from the North End, very connected. He was involved in politics over there. In fact, uh, whilst 
uh, meeting with some of his uh, political operatives. There was a reporter nearby and he was trying to listen in and he, he didn't catch his name completely. He heard Fitz. What he thought he heard was Honey Fitz, not Johnny Fitz. And the name Honey Fitz got put in the newspaper and that's how he became known as Honey Fitz Fitzgerald. And over in East Boston, there's PJ Kennedy and he ran a tavern over there. And this is where politics happens. He eventually ended up as a, a, a state rep from uh, Ward 2 in Boston and he, he ran uh, the East End. Now, a few years later, another young up and comer emerged. And this was James Michael Curley over in the south end of Boston, not to be confused with South Boston. This is uh, bordering uh, on Roxbury over in the southern part of the city. And uh, he had an interesting story onto himself. <clears throat> Let's talk about old Honey Fitz. Now, we must know Fitzgerald Kennedy, you know where this is going. And when we think of the, the, the Kennedys, we think of Palm Beach, we think of Pionis. But if you look, this is where they started out. This is Ford Garden Court over near North Square. And this is where Rose Kennedy Fitzgerald was, uh, I'm sorry, Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy was born. And uh, at a young age, Honey Fitz had to take over when his father died. And uh, he worked numerous jobs, became very involved in politics and worked his way up and eventually became the ward boss of Boston's North End. And here's where he lived for Garden Court. And oftentimes when he went throughout his, his area of the North End, he would, he would shout out to the people that he knew and call them my heroes. He referred eventually everybody in Boston was his dero. And he was a ball of energy. And then we had PJ Kennedy. This is an old uh, picture of him later in life over in East Boston. And uh, here is a picture of the Kennedys and the Fitzgeralds in Old Orchard Beach. And you can see here young Rose Kennedy along with Joe Kennedy. They would together start the great dynasty, the Kennedy dynasty together. And here he is even later in life with his grandson. I think you might know who that is. And then we have James Michael Curley, another one whose father died at a young age. His father was one of those ditch diggers that I referred to earlier, a big man. And he was challenged to go pick up a big boulder on the job. And he went over there and had a brain aneurysm trying to pick it up. He left his widow with two sons. James Michael was one of them. He had to leave eighth grade and go to work as a pharmacist delivery boy to help his mother out. And he lived right down here. This is the area in South, uh, the South End where he lived on, North, on Northampton Street, which today if you go to University Hospital, it's right in back there. Now the actual address was next to this old tenement building. So I'm imagining it probably looked a lot like that tenement building. And uh, young James Michael had to go out and work. And as a clerk, he, uh, he was told by many people that he had the gift of gab. And one time, one of his patrons said, boy, you got the gift of gab. You've got the blarney. You should be a politician. And he, he took it to heart. And he decided to run as city councilman. And he got himself elected. But it was here that he ran into trouble. Uh, here, he forms the, the Tammany Club, which was over on Hampton Street. And uh, he took Lemansky's model to the nth degree here. He helped everybody in and out. He helped his, his constituents so well, it got him thrown in jail. And this is how it happened. Uh, one of his constituents came to him and said, oh, James Michael, I, I didn't pass that postal exam. And he said, how come? Well, I couldn't spell Constantinople. So what did James Michael do? He said, I'll help you with that. The next time the exam came around, 
James Michael Curley with his eighth grade ed education, he was a self-educated man, he knew Shakespeare backwards and forwards, went and took that exam for that patron, masquerading as that patron. And, uh, the, and what happened was that he got caught and he got sent to jail for it. And this would follow him for the rest of his life. You'd think he'd be done. But he was mayor of Boston four times. He was governor of Massachusetts. He was a congressman. And every time they hit him with that, he'd say the same thing. He'd say, I did it for a friend. And that solidified him with his constituents because they knew he was willing to go stick his neck out for them to the point of going to jail. And he got elected over and over and over again. By the way, if you want to visit the site, this is what it looks like today. The building is no longer there, but you can still see where it was. Now, Mayor Collins ended up dying midway through his term and there was going to be election. And of course, Martin Lamansky had his man all lined up. The only thing was, uh, young Johnny Fitz wanted to be the third mayor and he went against his old, his, uh, his mentor, you might say, and he ran against uh, Lamansky and the, uh, the Brahmins up on the hill. And uh, he started to blame the Brahmins for all the troubles of the Irish. And his, his club was over in the North End on Chandler Street. This is the Jefferson Club. And he ran a great campaign. His campaign said that um, Boston could be bigger, better, and busier. And people believed him and they elected him. And he did just that. He brought business into Boston and he brought it into the 20th century. The thing was, because he was on the outs with the, uh, the Brahmins up on the hill in Beacon Hill, uh, they started to accuse him of nepotism. The old ward boss thing was still going on. There were lines up and down the hall. People wanting to get jobs, this and that. And a, a group was formed called the Good Government Association. Uh, Curly would later call them the Googoos. And they would hit him with these accusations of bribery and nepotism and he would not be elected for the second term as mayor. And it was here that he was the mayor of Boston, this, this beautiful Victorian, uh, I guess, Greek revival mansarded building in, uh, in Boston down on School Street, uh, which was replaced by this. Oh, I'm sorry, not that, this. Yes, this is the current city hall. Uh, which I'm sorry, I'm not a fan of Brutal's architecture. I think it's obnoxious. Anyway, Honey Fitz loved being mayor. He did get elected to a, another term after he was out for a while. He uh, skipped the term, came back. You can see here in 1906 to 1908, to 1910 to 1914. Now, he decided to run for a third term. And uh, I'll tell you about that in a minute, but this is a, this is a few pictures of him. You can see uh, down in Palm Beach with Jack Kennedy here. I really think that uh, when you study Honey Fitz, he had a great sense of humor, a uh, great storyteller. And I think uh, Jack Kennedy got some of that from his grandfather. Here you can see him there. And he loved people, he loved being there. And if you want to visit him, that's his grave. And that is in St. Joseph Cemetery in West Roxbury. And there is another memorial that, or there was another memorial, and that was the John F. Fitzgerald Expressway, which uh, if you're old enough, you can probably remember sitting in traffic there. That's since been removed. Of course, we know it's the Rose Kennedy Greenway. In, it's on top of what we call the big dig, or what we did call the big dig. That brings us to the mayoral race of 1913. Honey Fitz decides to run again, and his opponent is James Michael Curley. And they run against each other. And uh, at first, 
Uh, Honey Fitz is ahead in the polls. He's doing really well. And like I said, he was a fireball. He, he'd be at every little meeting, every organization in the city when there was an election going on. There's stories of people having wakes and all of a sudden Honey Fitz would show up at the wake and glad hand everybody and blow his way out of the wake. And the, the widow would look at everybody and say, I didn't know my husband knew Honey Fitz. And, you know, he didn't. <laughs> uh, but he was ahead in the polls. And uh, Curly was just this little known city councilman. Then something happened. Uh, every night after campaigning, uh, Fitzgerald would love to go to this old, uh, I guess you'd call it a roadhouse outside of Boston. And that's where he would relax and kind of wind down after a day <clears throat> of uh, campaigning. Now, he didn't drink. He was a teetotaler, believe it or not. And uh, many times he'd break into a song, Old Adeline, uh, Sweet Adeline, and he would do that you know, on cue probably every night at this roadhouse. But this particular night, he was dancing with his favorite cigarette girl, this young Irish girl named Toodles Ryan. And it said that he gave her a kiss on the cheek. Now, the thing is, one of Curly's operatives was in the tavern, in the roadhouse at the time, and witnessed this, this, this horrible act of lechery. And <laughs> before he knew it, there was a letter that was sent to Honey Fitz's wife saying, outlining what he had done. And if you can imagine, he came home to his wife, young Rose is sitting there next to her on the stairs of the, the stoop when he came in. And uh, she had this letter, like, uh, you got a lot of explaining to do, like Ricky Ricardo. Uh, and he talked his way out of it. He said it was simply uh, a platonic kiss. She's a young girl. I gave her a peck on the cheek. It was nothing of the sort. There was no kind of um, philandering going on or anything. And what this letter, the object of the letter was to make him drop out of the race because he thought this would be blown up. He refused to do it. He refused to drop out of the race. He refused to submit to these tactics. So you can imagine James Michael Curley is watching the papers. He's wondering when, when is uh, Honey Fitz going to drop out? It didn't happen. So Curley went to plan B. Plan B was to put an ad in the newspaper and in the ad, Curley said he would be doing two lectures. <clears throat> One would be uh, Great Lovers in History, Cleopatra to Toodles. And the next would be Great Libertines in History, Henry VIII till present. No, I think this was the last straw. Honey Fitz saw the writing on the wall. He knew where this was going to go. This guy played hardball. The, sometimes they call Curley the first modern politician. Honey Fitz dropped out of the race. James Michael Curley became the fourth mayor of Boston. And you can see him here. This is a perfect picture. He's kind of the uh, gangster politician almost. Now, when I studied him, uh, you know, uh, he was quite a, almost like a split personality. I'd be reading about him. I think, what a nice man he was. What a good man. And I'd read a couple pages later. Like, what a bad man he was. So what I'd like to present to you in closing, this is the good, the bad, and the curly. So you could say he was uh, the last of the ward bosses. He was uh, called one of the first modern politicians. Here's the good curly. At the Tammany Club, he'd often give Christmas dinners to people. He'd find the homeless homes, jobs for those who need it, and bring people in out of the cold. There's one story that uh, comes uh, through his, uh, his chauffeur, his driver. And uh, Curly would often work late into the night at City Hall. And the driver would be waiting for him. And then often be, he'd come out and it'd be a, 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 a common... Um, site near the city hall was this gentleman named Mike who was a drunkard and he'd be leading against the fillers and and oftentimes Curly would just go up with uh, you know a saw buck in his hand and put it in Mike's hand and say Mike here's the money I owe you and you know this was not in front of cameras there were no reporters there people didn't know this until after he died that was the good Curly 
Another thing he did was once he came into the office of mayor, he ordered that all of the scrubber women be given mops. Let that sink in. I showed you a picture of what a scrubber woman did earlier. They were down on their hands and knees with brushes. What this man did was he gave them dignity. And I should mention that his mother was a scrubber woman. That was the good curly. And you can see through the years, it, it's funny. As I said, he got elected four times. <clears throat> and it seems like it was every 10 years he'd get elected and people get fed up with him and then they'd forget and 10 years later he'd get elected again. So the bad curly, of course, is you know the Toodle story that we just mentioned. Uh, and also, if you look here, his first year in office, he bought this mansion. And even then, on a governor's, uh, I'm sorry, a mayor's salary, he could no way afford this. And of course, the screams of bribery and corruption came forward. And he claimed that he had investments with this plumber, who oddly enough, his name was Daly. And that's where all of his money came from. And we know, we know that was not true. Here's an example of the graph he would pull. He was crooked as, as a shillelagh, you might say. Uh, a roofer came to him one day <clears throat> and he said, oh, Mayor Curley, could you help me get a job? And Curley looks through and he says, okay, here's, here's a school over in the West End. I want you to go over there. And um, this is how much it's going to cost. I want you to put the bid in a lot higher. And he did that because he would skim off the top. He would take the residual. So that's not even the end of the story. The roofer went up, climbed up on his uh, ladder to take a look at the roof. The roof was perfect. He thought Curly made some kind of mistake. And he went back. He said, Mayor Curly, you must be mistaken. There's nothing wrong with that roof. He said, no, just go up there and make like you're doing something and come back. That's the crooked curly. Also, he had quite, quite a temper on him. There was a, an editor named Enright who was constantly writing editorials against him, claiming that he was crooked, he was uh, taking bribes, whatnot. And th this happened quite a bit. <clears throat> curly had a remedy for this. If somebody wrote an editorial like that, he'd simply sue him and they'd go away. Enright persisted until one day he met Curly on the street. He was coming down Washington Street and he saw Curly. Curly wound up and smacked him right into the jaw and knocked him to the pavement. And then when Enright came to, Curly was standing over him and hurling invectives out. Now, can you imagine Marty Walsh doing that or Mayor Menino? I, I don't know how he got away with it. He remained in office. <coughs> There's other examples also. One example is uh, he actually, um, a political opponent surrogate was on the radio, WBZ, I think, uh, bad-mouthing Curly before uh, an election. Little did he know, Curly was the next up. And Curly went into the booth while he was on the air and pummeled him right there on the air, still maintained his office. And in later years, after he uh, lost elections, uh, as you can see here, it looks like the 20s, <clears throat> Coming in the 30s, he tried to sidle up to Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt quickly found out what he was and distanced himself. And then he uh, lost his last election. Now, the, the last years he was in office as mayor, uh, he was getting kind of older and he was looking for places to put his money. He said that he had two safes full of cash in his house. And this is a this is an example of the con man getting cons. He came in contact with these um, people from Nevada who claimed to have a silver mine. And they wanted him to invest in the silver mine. And he thought that was great. He flew out there. And they showed him the silver coming right out of the tunnel. But what he didn't know was they went around and stuck pieces of silver in the dark. And they conned him into giving them all their money. And then they started to uh, peddle political influence down in Washington using his name. Long story short, he got in big trouble. He uh, got charged with fraud at the federal level and was sent 
to federal prison, Danbury State uh, federal, pen, federal, federal Penitentiary down in Connecticut. Well, this was during his, his last term in office, his fourth one as mayor, and he was still mayor of Boston, but in prison, believe it or not. And a petition went out to every politician <clears throat> in, uh, in New England to get him out of prison. And this is after World War II. And one politician refused to sign. He was a young PT boat captain. Would be a congressman pretty soon. Uh, I think he was a state rep at the time. Jack Kennedy refused to sign that petition. Kind of like karma coming back. Well, here he is during his latter years. He did run for a fifth term. <clears throat> As you see here, I think the next picture shows him number five, but he lost. And he, at this point, he was pretty destitute. Uh, he had run out of cash and he, he kind of became the sad figure hanging around the state house. Uh, this, this story I'm about to tell you comes from Tip O'Neill, who was a young congressman at the time, Thomas O'Neill. Uh, Curly came to Tip O'Neill and he, he said, look, Tip, uh, do you have anything that I could do for you? Uh, any jobs to, you know, make some money, raise some money for you? And Tip O'Neill knew the whole story. He knew what Curly had been through. Plus, Curly had had some really hard times. Uh, several of his children had died in the last few years which Curly would later think was God punishing him for his uh, nefarious acts. Anyway, Tip said, okay, I, I've got a deal for you. Go out and try to raise some money for me, okay? Get some donors and, and that's what you can do and I'll pay you a salary. Curly was on that until uh, uh, donors started to come to Tip O'Neill and say, Tip, I thought I gave you 15,000, where's the rest? And it was going into Curly's pockets. Well, <laughs> the old Curly was still active. Now, in his latter years, you'd think he would have gone out like this, but he didn't. He went out with somewhat of a bang. There was a book written by a local author called Edwin O'Connor called The Last Hurrah, which was 100% based on Curly, and everybody knew it except it's a fictional book and the mayor in the book is called Mayor Skeffington. Now, O'Connor didn't know how Curly would react to this. He didn't know Curly, he didn't want to run into him. He had heard what happened to Enright and he didn't want that to happen to him. And then one morning he was getting out of his car near the state house and he saw James Michael Curly. They locked eyes. Curly started to make a beeline for him. And the next thing you know, he put out his hand and shook his hand and he said, I love the book, I love the book especially the part where I die. So uh, O'Connor now knew that Curly loved his book. And before you knew it, Curly started going around doing lectures uh, on this book and referring to himself as Mayor Skeffington. To make it even better, this book was turned into a movie and it starred another Irishman, Spencer Tracy. Now, Here's his final resting place. And if you uh, look here, you can see it's his gravestone is somewhat like his resume. But I think the title that he cherished the most is probably the one that you see on the bottom there, the mayor of the poor. And if you ever want to go in, uh, well, this is, uh, this is how they, they uh, sent him off after he passed away in the early 50s, uh, because he was a one-term governor of Massachusetts. And I'm told the line went up and down Beacon Street. And I've met several people that were in that line. And if you'd like to go and sit down and have a chat with James Michael Crowley today, you can go down to Daniel Hall. And uh, I, I always say, maybe which one is the good curly, which one is the bad curly? That's kind of funny. And I used to bring my students here and they'd all sit on his lap and rub his belly. And I'd say, do you know who that is? And of course they'd say, nope. And I'd say, look look on that thing that's attached to your hand, that cell phone and ask who's James Michael Curley. Well, <clears throat> in closing, 
I'd like to say these people, the Irish, they came to America's shores. They came as servants. They came as prisoners, as half dead, starving refugees. They endured ethnic and religious persecution and bigotry. They endured squalid, wretched poverty. They endured backbreaking, menial labor. But in the end, they overcame, they surmounted, and they prevailed. Thank you for coming to see this lecture tonight. It's been my pleasure. And Christine, if you want to come back on. Here I am. Okay. Uh, I don't know if there were any questions in the in the chat box. There are a couple. Um, okay. we, we may only get to one or two of them. Um, okay. I, I just want to say that I really appreciate how many photos you had in there and some of the drawings and the illustrations yes. from much earlier times. That was kind of mm. impressive. And as a librarian, I'm a little appreciative of the oh. research you must have done to get Thank that. You. Thank you. <laughs> um, so somebody asked if you can explain how the Irish moved from the North End sure. to, to Southie as their base. Oh, it's just, uh, I think that was probably later uh, immigrations. Um, uh, different parts of the city changed. You had uh, like the Italians and the Jews kind of moved into uh, the North End and pushed the Irish out that way. So, and also in the South End, you, you had a big African-American population come in. So I think that's probably why they ended up going to South Boston. Also, South Boston was probably seen as the suburbs, probably a better place too back then. Uh, and that might have been a, a reason for them to move out there to Dorchester and South Boston, more of a, you know a place that wasn't so packed. I think there are also some histories that talk about how as other populations came into the country, you know, there was some migration, um, if yeah. you will, mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, there was always sort of a hierarchy. Um, the Irish were the lowest class when they came into the city. Mm -hmm. And then as, as another population yeah. came in, they became the lowest. So yeah, they, yeah, it's like they went through the crucible too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, where was Mayor Curley's house? Uh, it's on the Jamaica way. And I think I have, I thought I had the, the address someplace. I think oh. we can also look that up, but yeah. if you have it's it. Right yeah, and uh, I, it's not open to the public, but every now and then, if you keep an eye on it, uh, I know there were, of all people, Billy Bulger did a lecture there recently on um, on uh, Mayor Curley. I guess he's a fan of Mayor Curley, obviously. Um, and he is, he is buried, I didn't say this, he's buried at Mount Calvary uh, Cemetery in Rosendale. Okay. So the last question in Q&A, um, I'm just going to read it directly because I think okay. there are a tough, couple different ways you might take this um, or approach it as a question. Mm -hmm. Why is so little of the English-Irish oppression taught in our schools today? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this whole, this whole topic isn't really discussed too much. And uh, I should say a lot of people make the mistake, and I, I kind of, uh, in the beginning, I mentioned uh, the word slaves. Uh, these people were not uh, servants for life. They were eventually able to go on their own. This was not permanent servitude. And uh, in recent years, you've seen a lot of people talking about white slavery and they don't know what they're talking about really. Uh, these people were forced to come over here. They were indentured servants, but then they had a life after that. I don't, I don't know if that answers the question or not. Well, I think it. I, I think the question also um, ties into what we just said about how other populations, you know, the right. whole history of immigration, um, yeah, changes. It's also very uh, geography based. I grew up in the western mm -hmm. part of the state, and so, um, not that it isn't part of American history, but I think mm -hmm. that in certain areas, there's history that's more specific to that right. that region, if you will. And I, I would also say that it may not be taught in, say, high school. Uh, being a high school, middle school teacher, uh, you are doing survey courses, and you, you can't spend all. You, you might get uh, maybe a page on this, but in colleges they have full courses on this. I'm sure there's a whole major in Irish studies. So, wow. Yeah. 
Maybe some... I should go back to school. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would love that. You get some experience, you know. I would love that. Mm. Uh, well, thank you so much for giving us this presentation. Again, like I said, thank the you. images were really powerful and kind of make the history come alive for mm -hmm. someone like me. Um, thank you to our audience for staying with us tonight. And um, I did record this and I will be sharing that link with everyone later this evening. Mm -hmm. I will also send you a link to a feedback survey. So we always ask what you thought of the program okay. you attended and what else you'd like to see us offer. So that can be answered anonymously. So feel free to share that with me when you have time. Um, and if you're interested in thank history, you. There are some genealogy and history programs coming up at the end of March and around Patriots Day. So check our events calendar for anything else that might interest you. Um, and Chris, one of the compliments we got was I could listen to you for hours. And another one was you thank you. Did. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one was thank you for a beautiful presentation. Thank you. So thank you. thank you again for being here. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening and the warm weather ahead this week. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody.